were just discovering that I was permanent to make. That's why I had to miss the executive session. I knew. Thank you and welcome. It's my job to call to order the first organizational meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. So if you would please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The school board met last night in caucus to um, discuss its officers for the coming year and committee appointments. And so it is my job to call for nominations for the position of chair. Are there any nominations? I nominate John Christie. Is there a second? I second it. Do you accept the nomination? Yes, I do. Are there any other nominations? <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Seeing none, is there any discussion? Um, I'd like to talk for a few minutes about John Christie. Um, it's really an honor to have the opportunity to support him for chair. Uh, having worked with John now for three years, I've been impressed by his thoughtful, intelligent, and deeply wise demeanor. Um, John is always calm, and he has this gift of being able to listen carefully, ask just the right questions, digest the, inform the information very thoroughly and thoughtfully, and then passionately advocates for what he believes is in the best interest of the district as a whole. His fair-minded disposition has earned him the admiration of our board, teachers, administrators, and citizens. Uh, John's list of accomplishments in one term are noteworthy, um, at, you know, to say the very least. Uh, under his steady leadership as finance chair and then as vice chair for the last two years, uh, he, the school board has hired a top-notch superintendent, that's you, Meredith, um, four innovative and forward-thinking administrators, and John has been part of negotiating teams for multiple contracts and has kept our vision on market value. Three budgets have been passed as he's been on the board, and a new district-wide mission and vision was crafted. Uh, John, as a colleague, is a team player. He's always willing to do his part, and he does his part brilliantly to assure that our citizens are well served. Uh, you may not know this, but John's a very busy owner and CFO of an IT company in New York. He travels back and forth, so he doesn't have a lot of free time on his hands. I'm very grateful, and we are very fortunate that John is willing to offer his talent and his time to our community and to this board. I look forward to seeing where the board will go in the next year under his leadership. And so tonight, it is my honor to offer his name for chair, and I encourage the board to support me um, in voting for him. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. Any other discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of John Christie for chair? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Seven no. Mr. Christie. Woo! Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And thank you all. It's an honor to work with, with a, a board as committed and hardworking um, as this one. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next year working with all of you. Thank you. Um, and you'll have to bear with me as I try to move through our meeting agenda. Um, so the first order, the next order of business is the, uh, is the election of the board vice chair. Do I have a nomination for vice chair? I would like to nominate Michael Moore as vice chair of our school board. Second. Uh, any discussion? Any further nominations, I should say? Seeing none, any discussion? I'd like to speak on um, why I jumped at the chance to nominate Michael. Um, it might have been the uh, three hour, six hour car ride that we took. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, as we yeah, went. It was only an hour away. <laughs> I'd like to... It was a long day, wasn't it, Michael? <laughs> Trapped in the car with me. Um, but Michael has been um, on the board only two years now, and I find it incredible uh, what he's done in the past two years. He not only um, jumped on ready, but jumped on. Um, he, he revealed his uh, um, organizational skills. His, he has a, an amazing um, look at detail, which is just evident at the paperwork he, he brings to the table for the rest of us to uh, look at so that we can make the right decisions. Um, and every time, the, this was most evident when we came um, to the first, the, the first superintendent search, when we had a hired person, we were not successful, and then we went for a second search, and Michael really led um, that charge, his co-chair, um, to the hiring committee says, and he did an amazing job. Thus, we found Meredith, and um, the, then he stepped into finance chair, which is a huge undertaking with all the issues um, schools have these days. And the one other piece that I have to say is, I've, I've learned a lot from Michael, um, but he does this great job about uh, holding on to data. And when we start getting off topic and a little emotional in our discussions, Michael's the first one to keep us as a high performing uh, school board by saying, I'd like to see the information and I'd like to talk about what the, what's, what's this line? Um, the data that he has and then we can make a decision on what's in front of us. So where I would be, I think you'd be a fabulous uh, vice chair and I'd love to work with, um, work, work with you under that role. Thank you, Kate. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Okay, the next, uh, I think we'll look at standing committees as a slate. Um, so we have a, a um, two standing committees, a finance committee and a policy committee, and we have a slate in front of us um, for the chairs of each and the membership. Um, do I have a motion or a, do I have a, is it a motion or a nomination? Take either. You can recommend these appointments and a board member can second that. You can move it yourself. Okay, so, so the we're, we're, uh, I will re then recommend the appointment of Michael Moore as chair of the finance committee with full board membership and Joe Morrissey with cha as chair of the policy committee um, with Elizabeth Seifries and Kate Williams Hewitt as members of that committee. Do I need a second? second? <laughs> okay, any discussion of that slate? Okay, I, I, I guess I would just say that, um, Michael, I, I appreciate what you've done as finance chair already. I appreciate the effort that you've, you've made to reach out to, to town councilors and to present a budget in a way that's easy for, um, for citizens and, and other stakeholders to understand. Um, I think that, that clarity has been very valuable, so thank you for that. Um, and I'll say about the policy committee that there is a lot of really, really important work in front of the policy committee. Um, we've worked through a lot of state required policies, but um, what's coming up uh, is, is, allows for a lot more board discretion. And Joe, I think you'll do a terrific job uh, with that work. So thank you for Thanks. thank you for volunteering. Thanks for nominating. <laughs> uh, all those in favor? Okay. Um, we have a number of other other committee appoint other committee appointments to make. Um, so you could read the list and then a board member could move that slate. Okay, the list is 
Um, as the board representative to the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, Mary Townsend. As the, mem the board members of the Health Insurance Task Force, David Hillman and Michael Moore. As the school board delegate to Maine School Management Association, David Hillman. Um, as the school board de uh, delegate to the PATHS General Advisory Board, Kate Williams Hewitt. As the school board members of the Wellness Committee, Mary Townsend and Elizabeth Seifries. As the school board member of the, the, the Town Technology Committee, Kate Williams Hewitt as the school board member of the Transportation Appeals Committee, Mary Townsend, and as the school board member of the School District Buildings and Grounds Committee, Michael Moore. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? We're getting there. Or moving right along. <laughs> now we have um, a number of advisory committees. Um, as the school board's um, le legislative liaisons, David Hillman and Mary Townsend. As the school board member of the Dropout Prevention Committee, Joe Morrissey. As the school board member of the Co-curricular steering committee, Elizabeth Seifries, and as the school board member of the athletic steering committee, Elizabeth Seifries. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. That's uh, <coughs> that's already. Filled. Um, so, do, are there any adjustments to the agenda? No. Okay. Um, so, on to item number three: uh, the approval of school board minutes. Do I have a motion? Sure. I move that we approve the. Uh Executive session uh, minutes from uh, November 13th, regular business meeting from Tuesday, November 13th, and the workshop from Tuesday, November 27th, um, as noted in the packet under item three. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay, on to item number four, comments from Student representatives, Nolan. All right, so um, I'm going to start off with the biggest thing that's probably on everybody's mind, which is uh, the TEDx event, which um, despite uh, the event that you all, I'm sure, know occurred, it was actually a miraculous success. Um, uh, it, was, it was extremely inspirational. We heard from a number of speakers, um, both um, both previous students um, and current, we heard from a current student, we heard from, from uh, all these inspirational people who have done all these amazing things. Uh, um, it, was, it was really an um, uh, extremely enlightening day and uh, I was extremely surprised and impressed that the student body uh, could actually pull together and, and uh, make something like this happen. Um, I was extremely pleased and, and um, surprised actually at how how great it was um, uh, I'm should I should I elaborate on what TEDx actually was yeah absolutely. Um, well for I'm sure most of you know but um, TEDx was it was a day where we had I think it was 12 speakers come in um, and talk to us about a different kind of it focused. It did focus a little bit around our the, the new mission statement, um, which was uh, community, academics, passion, and ethics, 
um, which the first letters of those spell out CAPE. Um, and so we had uh, speakers who had stories that related to each of those areas. Um, for instance, we had um, one, one man who, who, the first guy who talked to us was a guy who came here from Pakistan and he had learned three languages and he just, his, his story was just basically um, to, <laughs> he basically just got everybody excited. His story didn't really have a, a concrete message to it, but um, basically it, it got everybody extremely excited for TEDx. And then we had, um, we had someone talk about uh, a school that they had started where it was kind of a, um, a non-conventional learning environment type thing where they would, um, where they would take school uh, students into the field uh, and they would learn about mountains while they were on top of mountains and like things like that, which seemed pretty interesting. Um, so it was, it was basically that type of thing. We even we heard from a, a student speaker, which was Piper Otterbein, and she um, talked about some of her her struggles with dyslexia and how she's kind of found her place um, in art, and she's now um, going to attend the uh, Savannah College of Art and Design, and she kind of talked about her transition from uh, struggling academically and not knowing what she was going to do, being kind of confused to kind of finding her niche and finding her place and, um, and uh, like flourishing. Um, so that, that was TEDx and it was, uh, I'm, the response from the student body, at least the, the people that I talked to, it was uh, extremely, uh, it was well liked. Um, people, I was surprised that people weren't upset to be sitting, sitting in a room for six and a half hours. They were actually excited to be there, which was kind of cool. Um, not something I expected. Um, so, also, uh, winter sports are in full swing now. Um, mock trial won its third straight state championship. Um, they'll be going to uh, the national championship in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, so that's exciting. Um, that will be, I believe, this May. And the junior class is starting to plan for prom. Um, and actually, surprisingly, the sophomore class, uh, led by their class president, Daniel Menz, is already thinking about prom, and they're already fundraising for that. They're very prepared and organized. Um, so the student council is very pleased with them. Um, the, also in student council, the seniors are uh, mostly just doing things uh, geared towards the, like, graduation type stuff, like t-shirt designs and things like that. We're also starting to hear from colleges about uh, early decision and early action schools. People are uh, starting to hear back about that, so that's, it's an exciting time of the year. A little nerve-wracking, but mm. exciting. Um, also, the student council has set up a technology committee, um, which is, is basically we've set up a blog so we can let students know about the inner workings of student council. Um, because without them actually having to attend our meetings. Um, so if we wanted to make our inf information and uh, what we're doing more accessible to the student body. Um, so we may be uh, officially releasing that soon. Um, let's see, also, um, I'd say that I, I did recently hear of a plan to, um, to integrate our mission statement a little more within the school, so there's, there's uh, some meetings have been planned uh, to meet with some of the class officers uh, as well as teachers um, in order to get that uh, community academics passion and ethics um, a little more, uh, I guess, integrated with the school itself. Um, so that should be interesting, the developments with that. That's it. Thank you. That's no an one. excellent update. Yes. Appreciate it. Um, so now on to item number five. Do we have comments from the public on agenda items? Seeing none, we'll move on to item number six, communications. And Meredith, you're going to prepare a slide while I, or should I just start? I'm going to right add an item. Yes, please, go right um, Which is, and if you'll bear with us, um, we don't receive any other type of remuneration, so we work for gratitude here. And so I want to express a little gratitude towards our, our chair, Mary Townsend, who's, who, Pastor, for her. You're the chair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
for What's this for? her service to the board over the past two years Thank and to you. the community. Uh, Mary's led the board through two challenging years with grace, charm, and quiet force. She's helped the board understand the wisdom of a narrow set of critical achievable goals and has delivered on all of them, including passing a school budget that maintain, maintained vital programs and services, successfully negotiating four separate collective bargaining agreements, supporting the development of a revitalized mission and vision statement, initiating the creation of a strategic plan for the district, beginning an online district report card to measure performance, launching an overdue audit of the Cape Elizabeth School Policy Manual, and supporting the district's literacy and professional learning community goals. And that's just in 2012. <laughs> um, and just your, Mary's work as a board chair. As a community member and a parent, Mary helped to create, plan, and deliver the first ever, ever TEDx youth event, uh, which we just heard about from Nolan, um, to be hosted by a main high school. As anyone who attended the event will attest, it was a profoundly inspiring testimony to the power of the ideas encoded in the mission and vision statement. Mm -hmm. Beyond these accomplishments, it's been a great pleasure to work with Mary, and I'm grateful to have Mary on the board for another full year. Thank you, Mary, for your service to the town, schools, and students. Thank you. Thank you all. And as I said last night, I think this is one of the most talented boards I've ever worked with, and it has been an honor to serve. And I look forward to seeing, you know, to serving another year and see what we do under this brilliant new leadership. So thank you. What a surprise and an honor. And thank you for your thank kind you. words. I picked out the flowers, Mary. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> Thank you. That's very sweet. Okay, so, so now we now move so on to the moment we've all been waiting for. Um, the real reason we're here, the cross-country team's state championship mm -hmm. recognition. Oh I think they're going to come up, actually. Can you all come up to the podium or around the podium? You guys can come come over on this right side, this then we'll be able to hear you. You want to face us? You want to be? Here. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You may not want to. Stand back. <laughs> it's really up to you. Uh, she put it on a bit quick. Uh, do you have something to say, Coach? Because I ha have a few things to say. Anything you want to say? Uh, sure. Um, it was a real pleasure to uh, coach these young gentlemen this fall. Um, and, you know, it's not always the, a chance that you get to win a state championship. And um, we were lucky that we were able to. And this is something that these uh, young men will never forget. And... Uh, like I said, a real pleasure to coach them. I think they learned a lot about um, what it takes to uh, reach a goal, and uh, I think that will carry over into everything they do in life. And that's one of the most important things about athletics. It's not just about the athletic accomplishments, about the lessons that uh, they learn. We started training in June, so there was a lot of hard work put into the effort. And, uh, you know, these are the benefits of the efforts. So. Uh, I just want to thank them for all their, their hard work throughout the year. Now, Meredith put that picture on a bit too I'm early. Um, my, my current was going to be when they saw all you and how clean cut you looked, and I was going to say, <laughs> I don't remember that. I took a picture at the state championships, and they look like that. And if you can <laughs> see it, they have very unusual haircuts, and you can't quite see the third kid from the left. But I want to know what kind of parents that kid has. I mean, that kid is hideous looking. But he's not here. He's at the science meet, so he can't do anything to me about it. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about, some of you don't know much about cross country. Some of you do. Um, the members, the, we have a very large team this year. I'm just going to name the, 
the varsity members, uh, Liam Simpson, who's the captain, Peter Doan, captain, Will Britton, and I'm naming them in order of their times and their ranking of the team, which will become important later. Uh, Kyle Kennedy's fourth, Justin Garrett, Julian Pelsner, sixth, Trevor Ewald, seventh, Zach Hillman's eighth, Joe Inhorn's ninth, Sam Rinshaw's tenth, and Sam Boxdale's eleventh. Um, a little bit about cross country, they run 5K, which is about 3.1 miles. They run it through woods, hills, puddles, ticks, you name it. Um, mud. A lot of mud. Uh, during the regular season, every one of the team runs, but during, when you get to the, uh, the league championships, the regionals, the states, New England, only the top seven get to run, and only the top five scores count. Um, the, we have a variety of individual accomplishments on this team. Uh, Leanne Simpson, who's not here, who's at the science meet, I believe, was first team all-conference and he was first team all-state. Uh, Peter Doan, who I do see, uh, was first team all-conference. I was concerned I was going to say Joe Doan instead of Peter Doan, <laughs> but I managed to do it right. Uh, Justin Garrett got second team all-conference, and we had one member who got Western Maine Conference all-academic team, and that was Zachary Hillman. And all the kids on the team, uh, according to the coach, achieved their PR this year, which is their best time of their life. So every member of the team from freshman to varsity achieved a PR this year, which is an amazing feat. Uh, as a team, they, they had a lot of awards. They came in fourth at the Festival of Champions. That's a meet that's held in Belfast with over a thousand kids from all over the East Coast and Canada run. And we came in fourth. Uh, we came in second in the Western Conference Championships to Falmouth, a big rival. We won the Western Maine Regional Championships, we won the State Class B Championships, and we're the top Maine team in the New Englands, and that includes all the Class A teams. Um, and to speak briefly about the depth of this team and how everybody contributed, at the Festival of Champions, they had three classes. The freshman class, a seeded class, which is the best kids, usually the fourth or fifth best kids on teams, and the unseeded class, which means the other varsity kids got to run. And the freshman class was 170, over 1,000 kids ran, males um, and females. I didn't count the females because it was a male team here today. And the freshmen, uh, we placed, Justin Gret placed eighth out of 173 kids. Joe Inhorn placed 20th and Joe Moen placed 39th. For seeded, um, Leon Simpson came in 10th, Peter Doan came in 17th, Kyle Kennedy came in 40th, and Will Britton came in 43rd. In the unseeded division, which is 342 kids, it looked like, I took a picture of it, it looked like someone kicked over the world's biggest anthill when they were all running at us. Uh, Zach Hillman came in sixth, Sam Earnshaw came in 10th, and Sam Barksdale came in 35th, which is a pretty amazing feat. And what was kind of nice about that, it, uh, the best runners uh, were probably more pleased about the unseeded kids and the freshmen than they were about anything else. When some of those kids came in with those great times, I watched them all hug each other and cheer each other. It was really, heartwarming. Um, we did have a big rival this year, which was Falmouth. Uh, we came in right behind them almost all year long, uh, right behind them in the Festival of Champions, right behind them in, in the regular meets. We came in second to them in the Western Maine Conference. We beat them in the regionals, and we beat them in the states, and we beat them in the New England. But the victory at the state championship was kind of interesting. Our first three runners are unbelievably good. They can compete with anybody in the state. But the coach emphasize all year long that it's a team. And we won the states because of the, the, the seven kids that ran. The last two kids, the fourth and fifth team, uh, literally is what won it for us. And one of them, uh, Justin Garrett, uh, literally in the last 500 yards or so, pulled it out and beat the Falmouth kid. It's the equivalent of, uh, which you may understand better, Larry Bird sinking a three-point shot with uh, nothing left on the clock. It was that that much fun. And that's what they look like. Well, they don't look like that, but that's what they look like when they won. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> actually, it looks better. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Um, I, I do, besides the team, I do want to say something about one individual of the team. Uh, because we, at school board, um, we, we fund these things and we hope that it generates uh, teamsmanship, uh, goodwill, uh, sportsmanship, uh, honor, um, all kinds of moral and, and societal values. Um, there was particularly, right before the New England Championships, what I would classify as a singular 
singular act of loyalty, teamsmanship, kindness, uh, but mostly one of honor and integrity. And um, I want him to raise his hand. It was Trevor Ewald. And you could, too bad you could turn around and be like, that's a good boy, turn around and look on TV. Um, he was the seventh rank, only seven got to run in New England. And it's a huge event because Maine doesn't make it very often. And it's the culmination of an entire year. And Trevor was the number seventh man. Number eighth uh, runner was, ran a good year, was doing much better at the end of the year. Uh, they, were, they were neck and neck, but Trevor earned his spot. He was going to run. The night before the event, at the team meeting, he announced he was giving up his spot to the eighth runner, which I find an amazing sacrifice. The, he could have, I'm not sure what he would explain why he did it. I think he did it in part for the team, because the eighth runner was running very well, but I don't really think that was a reason. I, I think it was an act of pure generosity, of, of friendship, uh, a sense of honor and integrity. And the reason I think he did it was because the, the eighth member was a senior, he was a captain. It was going to be his, he wasn't going to be able to run in the last race of his career. Uh, he had run for, it was his fourth year, he had run the three previous years hurt, um, very hurt, ran in every single race, no matter how poorly he did. And I think Trevor gave up his spot. Uh, he didn't have to, and, it's, and it was a significant sacrifice because they, they may not make the New Englands next year. Um, so I, I just was stunned at, the, at, at that. Everybody talked about it in New England. People were proud of that and the team, uh, how well they did. Um, um, I just thought it was a, it was, it was a, it was a great thing, Trevor. Um, it was, it was a sign of respect. It was a sign of moral fortitude. It was, quite frankly, it was an act of honor. Um, I know you, you may be a bit young to understand this, but. Uh, Philosophically, we always question, what, what makes a good life? Or a famous book calls it, what, what's the true measure of a man? And it's um, not how many awards we win. It's not how many medals we win. It's not how big a house is. It's not what schools we get into. It's not how much money we make. It's what we do. It's our deeds. It's what we do when we're faced with circumstances we have a moral choice. Um, that's what defines us, and that's what makes us who we are. At situations where we have a choice of honor versus dishonor, or morality versus immorality, or selfishness versus sacrifice, that's truly the measure of a man. Um, your gift came at a cost. You sacrificed something. That makes it extremely meaningful, not just for the person you did it for, but for you, because things like that don't happen very often. I've been a lawyer for 35 years. I've had scores of instances where people pillars of the community could have done, had a choice between doing something that cost them something, but it was the honorable thing to do. And I can tell you flatly, in 35 years, it's almost never happened. Maybe once. They always chose themselves over the act of honor. Um, and I think you've shown very early in life uh, what your true measure of a man is. Um, I, I want to end it with a, uh, a quotation that I think sums it up. It's by Winston Churchill. And it says, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Um, we're all proud of you. Your teammates are proud of you. Your parents are certainly proud of you. Uh, your school's proud of you. The school board's very proud of you. In fact, our whole community is proud to consider you a member, and, and we want to thank you. Yeah. That's it. Thank you, David. You guys can and, uh, sit down now. Thank you, guys, and congratulations. congratulations. Coming back. Good. <laughs> Unless you want. You're next. <laughs> that was pretty. That was very sweet. So the next item is six. B, and we'll wait for a moment while the team files out. But the next item is 6B, the superintendent's report. Tough act to follow. That is a tough act to follow. <laughs> but we can. Um, first, I want to start. I'm pleased to recognize uh, middle school teacher Susan Dana. Um, Susan has been selected to participate to participate in the Uruguay Educator Exchange Program, sponsored by the U.S. State Department. 
which is one of a small number of um, teachers across the country who've been chosen to participate in this. She will be hosting a teacher from Uruguay here in February, which is a very bleak month in some ways to send someone to Maine. Oh. <laughs> um, but it's a good taste of winter, and um, we're very excited about that. Um, Susan is busily planning the agenda for the visiting educator when, um, when she is here. And we hope that the educator will be able to attend uh, the school board meeting in February as well. So you'll have a chance to meet her and hear about some of their experiences. Susan will then visit Uruguay in the summer for uh, three weeks, I believe. Very exciting. Uh, the instructional support department, and it's included in your packet, um, received um, notice from the State Department of Education that they have met all requirements for um, Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act reporting requirements. So that is a good thing. <laughs> um, there are a number of categories. Meets requirements is the highest level, and um, that's, that's where we want to be. So congratulations to um, Jane Golding and the instructional support team. Pond Cove was awarded the bronze level recognition for the Let's Go program. It's a nice honor, which means they are promoting healthy um, choices and wellness activities within the school setting. And as you can see, their principal, Kelly Hassan, is a shining example of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. We also have seventh grader Fiona Simpson um, is being honored by the First Lady of Maine in the Maine Arts Commission. And her artwork has been selected for inclusion in the Maine Youth Excellence in Art Exhibition, which will be held at the State and Capitol Complex. Next week, a week from today, I believe. As you heard from Nolan, um, last Friday was a terrific event at the high school. Um, I was able to be there throughout the day. I heard from a number of visitors, from um, students who are participating, from um, faculty members about what a positive experience it was. And I can certainly echo um, Nolan's comments that um, it was a very moving and inspirational day. And I didn't have the vantage point that um, a couple of the technicians had, but I do know from a couple of the technicians who were working the day that um, they saw lots of members of the audience move to tears at different points and could really see, um, I think, the full body um, responses to some of, to some of the speakers. Mm -hmm. it, it was a very powerful and moving experience. Um, so. My, my compliments to um, the students and faculty members and community members um, who were involved in organizing that day. I, I hope it's something that we continue to do. Um, and I know students um, certainly feel the same way. Our mock trial team, also as Nolan pointed out, um, won its third state championship, so consecutive state championship, which is another great honor. So we'll be um, hearing from them um, at a future meeting, I believe. <laughs> Great That's coaching too, I hear. I, I, yeah. I heard that as well. <laughs> <laughs> there are some repeat coaches um, working with that group as well. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to speak about, it was brought to my attention that um, there has been, um, that the municipal employees will be given December 24th off as a paid um, day off that there's nothing in school district employee contracts that provides for December 24th as a paid day off, December 25th is a paid um, holiday for employees, but not the 24th. Um, so I'm looking for your feedback about the use of that day for employees. Um, I believe this is something, according to Pauline, who is um, my best historian on this particular issue in her 15 years, um, that, that this is something that only comes up when um, the 24th falls on a Monday, um, and that there has been some precedence historically for providing people with time off on that day, but that it has been in her time here once it was a paid day off and the other um, occasion it was not. So I'm just looking for some sense of how the board feels about that. The impact is to about 16 employees, um, our hourly um, employees, um, primarily, and um, the total cost to the district is somewhere in the $2,000 range. Uh, is there feedback from Meredith on that? 
So some clarifying question. questions, maybe? Absolutely. Um, so there's 16 affected employees, and then, I'm sorry, the other employees in the district who aren't affected by this, what are they, what's the parity? It's a, it's a vacation, it's not a paid day. So they're really, in that sense, there isn't. They're paid time. These are, these are year-round employees, not 180 or 185 or 183-day employees. These are year-round employees who have uh, weeks of vacation and holidays. Does that help answer your question? Somewhat. Okay. Meredith? It's not a work time for those other employees. <clears throat> anyway. Okay. It's, it's the salary they're getting paid anyways. These are the only people who don't get paid because they're essentially hourly employees. Okay, okay. That helps a lot. And they are, they do work um, that's um, in relation to the, uh, the town employees who are getting this day off. So there are central office, business office um, employees who are school district employees, but their colleagues in the municipal side will not be working right. that day. It will be a paid day off for them. Um, community services employees, in theory, would be working that day, their colleagues at the library, to get a municipal department versus a school department would not be working that day. Right. That and the students won't be at community service because it's a closed, it's a day off. Well, that depends right. on this decision, <laughs> right? Um, in part, this decision. So, um, so it would affect families. Do we have an, inf or, uh, an idea of how many families it would affect? Or I don't know because honestly, the last time that this was really an issue was seven years ago, and um, I don't think there's a right. institutional memory for that particular data point. Oh, uh, my question is: Do we offer extended care on a day that we don't have school anyway? It wouldn't be extended care, but programs. Yeah, other programs. Okay. So the pool department, for example, would be open, or community services, other activities potentially would be running. And those are the 16 employees that we're talking about? Pool employees, the pool, community, community services, services, central office, and our um, custodial and maintenance mechanics. And so they would basically be the only municipal employees oh, that are paid for by the school department, but town-wide, the only employees who would be working that day. And what's unusual about the calendar that this happens every seven years? I, I didn't really um, follow that. This <laughs> Christmas is on a Tuesday. A Monday and the holiday falls on a Tuesday. <clears throat> but if the, so the next year, the holiday will fall on Wednesday. And why will, why won't it be, why wouldn't it be nice next year to be paid on December 24th? I'm sure it would be nice every year, but the precedent has only been to provide a day, to provide it as a paid day off when the holiday has fallen on a Tuesday, when Christmas has fallen on a Tuesday. Make it a four-day weekend for him? So they get a four-day weekend. Be... It's simply because of an ex it allows it an extended weekend so they can travel. And you don't have an extended weekend when it's on a Wednesday, Thursday, although it could be a Friday, I guess. In, in, so, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't follow one other piece, which is, the, are peop, these are people who would be working or would not otherwise be working? They would be. They would be working. Correct. Okay. Because they are considered year-round right. employees. Okay. So. Um. I, I'm, I'm just, you don't need to take a vote on this. I'm looking for your feedback and, and your responses and... I mean, I think if everything's closed, well, there's one, you know, if it's uh, Christmas Eve, I don't know if we're allowed to say that, actually. But if it's, uh, the, whatever, uh, the day before Christmas um, and everything's closed, I have no problem with, uh, you know, if everything's closed, we'll be closed. Now, a different issue is I don't think it should it be paid. And I would say if it's not, uh, you know, that's why you have, you negotiate and have it. So I'd be reluctant to provide an exception to something given, um, you know, that, that that's what you spend sometimes many months going through. So I would, you know, if everything's been closed, I would support closing it and just, it's a, it's a free day to be with your family. And if you're not working, then it's, you're, you're not, you're not working, so. 
you wouldn't be paid because it's not covered under the contract. So in, in essence, Michael, if an employee elected to take, if they had vacation time and elected to take that on that day, that would be okay, but you are not in favor of having that be a paid day off for employees. Because uh, if, uh, if it's, you know, that's why you have all these dates and you go through them, here's the paid day offs, and I'm just, you know, because whenever you make an, I'm just saying whenever you make an exception, you, many times has unintended consequences, so I would say. Um, that would be my two cents. Um, we could maybe look to how this is dealt with in other government institutions. Like, for instance, the state of Maine is giving similar employees a half a paid day. It's sort of a compromise. Um, and then they can use the other half for like, vacation time. This is one way of considering it. I had a quick thought. The real problem will be is the municipal employees get it, school employees don't. There's going to be a sense of unfairness. On the other hand, I, don't, I, I do see Michael's point. It, these things are all bargained for. They're all bargained for a certain number of paid and unpaid days. I do think that somebody could take, if, if you are giving them a day off and they don't have to work, but they don't get paid. So um, I, I would be in favor of that. Um, I'm not. There's, it's only about 2,000, so I'm not. Would not be strenuously against it, except for uh, I just caution. I, I agree with Michael. There's every time you do something, there's a ripple effect, thin edge of the wedge, whatever you want to call it. That there is always some consequence to it. The other side of the negotiating coin, it seems to me, is that you, ought, you also, and I don't know because I'm not sure exactly which, which, which collective bargaining agreement we're talking about, but you also negotiate for the number of days that you work, right? So if you impose a day off without pay, it may, is, it allow, is that allowable in, under the terms of the collective bargaining bargaining agreement, because that, that, that could be considered a, a, a reduction in force. And that's why I think I interpreted Michael's question the way I did, which is to say, you know, you could elect to use a vacation day if you had one available to you, but, but we wouldn't be paying you for a day off. And that's what I, that's what I was understanding from his comments. I, I hear your point very clearly, and I, I think there are distinctions as you work among the different collective bargaining agreements, um, and there are multiple. Um, there are a couple of collective bargaining agreements that are, are impacted, and there are some employees who don't fall under a collective bargaining agreement. Right. So there may be one case, in other words, in which we're, we're able to unilaterally say, you're not working today and you're not getting paid, but there may be cases in which we can't unilaterally say you're not working today and you're not getting paid. If that's a work day, they have the right to work and get paid. Um, whether or not, if they take a holiday, that's a, that's outside, that, that's a different issue. And, and How's that for clear guidance from that? I'm not looking for, I wasn't looking for clear guidance. I was looking for your feedback and um, your questions and, and comments are helpful. And I actually think John's point is the most weighty one. If, I don't want to be in, in violation of a union contract, create a grievance, and we're trying to do somebody a favor. Well, I think we could unilaterally say that, w that we are granting you a the day off. off with pay. I think that could unilaterally be done. I doubt anyone would contest no. that on the I mean, there isn't some the Calvinistic, I, I live to work person there. There could be. But. <laughs> I think that's it. I think we chewed that. A, a moderate risk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. That concludes my report. Okay. Thank you, Meredith. Um, so we're we're going to add an item C. Because Mary wanted to speak on the TEDx. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was gonna, and I'm sorry I didn't mention that sooner. I was gonna 
jump in with Meredith as she spoke. Sorry. That's okay. That's all right. Um, I just didn't, you know, and I, I don't mean to TED access to death, but I, I did really, um, it was such a tremendous effort and, and conglomeration of time and talent. I, and as an organizer, I wanted to just have the opportunity to, um, to add my comments. Um, number one, uh, I think, for those who don't know, it was a 12-month process of bringing people aboard and, um, and collectively thousands of hours from students, faculty, Jeff Shedd, community members, um, and speakers. Uh, we had a student organizing team that I was very proud to work with, the 14 kids who met weekly, some of them even over the summer to plan this event, um, every Tuesday afternoon or morning. Um, I also want to mention that, mention that this was all privately funded. Um, a couple of us went out and raised all the money for this event ourselves, so no taxpayer dollars were used on this event, and it was um, by the generous donations of some of our local um, businesses that this event occurred without cost to the district. Uh, I would share Meredith's and, and Nolan's uh, assessment of the day. It was lovely, and there were, um, we had a, not only the students were there, but many members from the community, elected officials, um, uh, some state officials even, uh, and I heard from parents, you know, I, as an organizer, I've received many comments myself, um, from emails and calls from people who were very excited by the event. Uh, parents, I had three parents in particular call me and say that they stayed up late into the night, past midnight, talking about um, how this event really touched their, their um, children and um, inspired them to think big about what they wanted to do with their lives, which to me was the goal. Uh, I wanted to read a couple of quotes, one from a parent and one from a teacher. Um, this from a teacher. I know this needs to be addressed to many others as well, but I need to say that in my 19 years of CAPE, rarely have I felt as, pr as proud, engaged, enthralled, and moved. This day was an example of the best of what we try every day to do. Um, and then from, this is just one of dozens of comments that I've gotten from parents, great success. Huge thumbs up from my son and his buddies, and they are not easily impressed, or at least they won't admit it when they are. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> we all know what that is. Um, I asked three of them last night, and they said, awesome. One of the coolest things they had seen, really amazing. Thank you for all of your work and effort. Um, and so I, I did want to say that we have received dozens of compliments um, from the public, and I think it was a very meaningful event for the students and community members who got to share that day. Um, and I'd like to, to give a special thanks to Jeff Shedd, who was on board from the beginning and a key, key player, and really made this day very special for a lot of kids, and I think we've yet to see um, the uh, you know, the effects of how this will reach kids. And um, we'll try and do it again in two years for the next junior and seniors. So thank you for um, indulging me. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for that report. And thank you, thank you to you and everyone else who was involved in organizing the event, which was really was phenomenal. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming. OK. Uh, that brings us to item seven, new business. Letter A, the consideration to approve High School World Affairs Council trip to Johns, John, it says John Hopkins, but it's really Johns Hopkins <laughs> University um, model United Nations Conference, September, I mean, sorry, February 7th through 10th, 2013. Uh, do I have a motion? Yes, I move that we approve the High School World Affairs Council trip to John Hopkins University <laughs> Model United Nations Conference, February 7th through 10th, 2013. Second. Uh, any discussion? Can I Aside approve? from the name of the university we're sending kids to. I could just indicate that this is an annual trip. Um, Mr. Shedd 
certainly answer any questions, but uh, Melissa Oliver, who's a, a history teacher at the high school, is coordinating um, this trip, and it has been um, very successful um, in the past. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Uh, okay, letter B. Consideration to approve the following athletic staff nominations. Do I have a motion? I move that we approve the following athletic staff nominations. Um, would you like me to read them? Sure. Yeah, there's so few. As long as I don't have to read all of the things that follow that. Christopher Marston as the ice hockey boys assistant coach. Stephanie Kramer as the Nordic coach. And Ellen King as the girls basketball coach. Do I have a second? A second. It's okay. I'm going to say Elizabeth was quicker. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any discussion? Uh, all those in favor? All right. Um, letter C, consideration of the following policies for second reading. So, uh, Joe, are you prepared to make a motion? I am prepared to make a motion. Thank um, you. I move that we, are, um, that we consider the following policies as listed in our Tuesday, December 11th, 2012, school board regular business meeting um, under item 7C. I'm not going to read them all. Um, but I move that we consider them for a second reading. Um, I would like to amend the motion. We, um, I move we approve the following policies. Is it approved? Yes, second reading yes, is approved. for adoption. Well, I Rephrase. Would you like me to rephrase or just accept your amendment? Would you accept the amendment? I accept the amendment. Okay. Do we have a second? David. Um, any discussion? Can I just point out um, one correction that was identified in the, um, in the agenda notes but that wasn't part of the motion? Um, was that the relations with law enforcement policy and procedure um, should be on the list for adoption. It was not, it should not be adopted with no changes recommended. It should have been on the upper part of on that On the second list. reading. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor? All right. Um, D. Consideration to approve the following policy for first reading. Um, I move that we um, approve the following policy for first reading, BBAA board member authority, item 7D in tonight's agenda. Do I have a second? Second. You, you don't need one because you don't oh, have to we're not vote voting. on this particular right. piece. Okay, thank you. But if the board has any feedback, it should share that with the new policy chair prior to the next policy meeting. Oh, you don't want comments now? Sure. Um, my quick comment is that it's somewhat uh, a little bit of a non sequitur. You have a statement that members of the board shall have authority only when acting as a board legally in session. And then later on you have an exception for when people act in pursuance of specific instructions from the board. I can think of instances, especially when I've been in front of the legislature where you try to get, uh, there has to be a little bit more flexibility than that. Um, when you're delegated, the, the board can delegate authority to uh, a board member to act when they're not acting when the board's legally in session. I think the wording should be, I suggested the wording be looked at to allow for delegation of authority for somebody to go have some flexibility when they go, for example, to the state legislature or when they at a, at a other function where they have to make certain decisions within the realm of, uh, of general guidelines. That would be my suggestion. And what type of action would you need to be taking in well, attending general sessions? Uh, general sessions? Legislative sessions. Well, for example, when you testify and, um, and, and have to answer questions, you can't possibly anticipate everything that might be asked of you or everything you, every position you might be asked to take. There may be amendments approved and so forth. So if you're given, 
there may be instances where you have to be given general authority to act within certain parameters to allow you the flexibility to state what the position of the Cape School Board is um, in, in face of changed circumstances. And maybe you won't, don't get broad enough authority, so you can't, but you should at least allow the possibility to allow a delegation of broad authority within certain parameters. And I, I don't think this quite does it. That's my thought. But isn't the uh, alternative what the board would want? If, if, if that example, if someone said the Cape Elizabeth board thinks X and we don't, then we're not bound by it. Isn't that, I mean, someone could say, well, what if someone said something and I'm speaking on behalf of the Cape Elizabeth School Board, but it, it just says we shall not be bound by it unless they're specific. Well, I'll give you two examples. One, they are asking for the position, they may ask for the position of the school board, so I'm not going to stand up and say and rely on, hey, I'm acting on behalf of the school board, but then again, um, nobody's going to be bound by what I say. I think that's um, misleading. Secondly, when, you're, when we're voting on, for example, uh, at the state delegation on, on policies and positions by the Main School Management Association, a lot of things come up. Things came up this year which uh, weren't anticipated that we had to get some specific or general authority to go do. I'm just saying is that when you have these sorts of things, that you consider the fact there'd be a circumstance where you've given somebody authority to act and something will come up and if you want the person there and you want them to open their mouth with the name of Cape Elizabeth on it, you have to allow for a broad delegation of authority within parameters. That's Meredith. all. Meredith? Yeah, and I, the examples that we've discussed specifically, and not to say that there may not be others, the examples we've discussed specifically, I think, all fall under committee appointment roles or as the legislative liaison. I think it would be implicit if the board has appointed you to that role that you would be therefore able to speak in that capacity before the legislature, but I, I appreciate it. I, I would agree with you, except when there's a specific board policy that says I have only authority when acting as a board legally in session. I, I would read the last clause, except when such statement or action is in pursuance of specific instructions from the board. So if we specifically appoint you as the legislative, if the board specifically appoints you as legislative liaison, I would interpret that more broadly to say okay. that it, it would then give you the authority. I'll, I'll say one more thing, then I'll quit, because we'll do this in the policy. That is an exception <laughs> that allows the school board not to be bound. That's exactly my problem. It's not an exception for me to act unilaterally or within broad discretion. It simply says that I can act, but you guys aren't going to be bound by it. It's circular and doesn't allow me to vote in favor of something. I believe that the spirit of the intent of this is so that no one of us then goes outside of the school board to speak on behalf of the school board. Our spokesperson is our chair and any other. So as we are in session, we are speaking as a board. We vote on, on emotions that are before us. That is our public decision making. And then any other um, public statements that need to happen, happen to us. Chair, say the press calls. I'm not going to speak for the board, but John should. This is far broader than that specific instance. So that I'm, I'm using that as another instance where I think that this sums up the role of a school board member in representing the school board as a member of a broad body, not as an individual. Meredith? Good question. So, David, if, it, if the first sentence were to read, and again, I'm something to the effect of members of the board have authority only when acting as a board legally in session or in an appointed capacity? I'd or be glad, I, I was trying to be the, something last, along those quit. lines. I'd be glad to suggest language that okay. uh, in that vein when the time comes and submit my language because Perfect. I think there is a way to make this work right. and it's implicit anyways no individual member has the authority to act without specific authority from the board anyway so. Exactly. I, again, I don't want unintended consequences of having a policy that sort of states what's already true anyways. So that's all. I hear you. Okay, so will anyone who wants to join our policy committees? <laughs> they used to meet at 7 a.m. 7, 7.30 a.m. Yeah, but that first know Monday when of the month. And you're gonna do that, Excellent. doing that so I don't show up, I know that. Um, <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Uh, so we'll move on to letter E, 
consideration to approve the superintendent's nomination to first continuing contract. Do I have a motion? I move. Oh, go. I move we approve um, Brianne Gallagher as the Pond Cove School Counselor to continuing first continuing contract. And second. I'll second. Very good. Is that Mary? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it can be. Um, any discussion? Meredith. So uh, Ms. Gallagher has been the counselor at Pond Cove for the last couple of years. Um, she was on maternity leave for a portion of last year. She would have typically been moved to continuing contract at the end of her second year, which would have been last year. But due to her maternity leave, according to our contract, the appointment to continuing contract is delayed for the amount of time that a person is on maternity leave. So in um, her case, it's been that amount of time, and so I am recommending her for continuing contract at this time. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Okay, um, letter F, consideration to approve the Nordic Ski Team trip to Sugarloaf Outdoor Center, December 28th to 29th, 2012. Um, I move that we approve the Nordic Ski Team trip to the Sugarloaf Outdoor Center in Carabasset Valley, December 28th to 29th, 2012. Second. But can I amend that? Oh, sure. Um, my daughter happens to be on the ski team, and I know that they're practicing at the Outdoor Center, but they're actually staying in a motel in Wil Wilton. I believe that's on the form, actually, okay. uh, the, although not in the motion. The motion is to ski at Sugarloaf, but I believe that is correctly identified in the form. As well as Black Mountain? Yes. Okay. Um, it's the next to last, well, not quite. <laughs> it's towards the end of your yeah, packet. It, it, it's all in uh, there, the comfort it's in. It's in there, but it does identify Black, that information Black correctly. I'm looking at it now. Uh, it's in the trip location slash itinerary portion. So it looks like it's all in there on the... Uh, it's all in there? Okay. Yep. I know that that was a last minute change for the team. I just wanted to ensure that it was there. Okay. So are you amending your motion or not? No, I'm going to keep it as is. Okay. Second? Michael? <coughs> Any discussion? All those in favor? I would like to say there was a number of cross-country team members that are also on the Nordic team. I can't wait to see what they do with skis on. <laughs> okay. Um, I think letter G, the cons consideration to approve the appointment of a school district physician pursuant to Title 20 AMRSA Section 6402-A. <clears throat> do I have a motion? I move that we approve the appointment of a school district physician pursuant to Title 20A MRSA Section 6402-A. Second? I'll second. Mary? Any discussion? Do we have to name Meredith? the person? I would like to name the yes. person. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am recommending um, Dr. Samita Santi um, for the position of school physician. Uh, Dr. Santi is a practice, uh, family practitioner and um, currently working at Martins Point. Um, she um, has a strong background in particularly adolescent health policy and um, is, has already met with our school nurses and with me um, for interviews and is enthusiastic about stepping into this role and working with the school district. Um, her stipend for the position um, as set by budget is $1,000 um, for the year. And it's a one-year appointment. So, Meredith, what type of services will our school district physician provide for us? Well, under state statute, um, the, the role of the school physician uh, is to um, advise the administrative unit on school health issues, policies, and practices, and perform any other health-related functions assigned by the board. Uh, at this time, I would envision that she would likely serve as a um, representative to our wellness committee, uh, work with us around some policy, health-related policy pieces and practices, our exposure, uh, bloodborne pathogens, exposure protocols, those sorts of pieces. Thank you, David. I actually raised my hand. 
Um, I just want to clarify for the public, this, we are not hiring a full-time position. It's a, uh, essentially an advisory role to be used when we want. It's going to cost us, it's a set fee of $1,000, which is for, a, uh, and it's required by state law. So. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Okay. H, consideration to approve an extended leave request for a middle school teacher during the 2012-2013 school year. I have a motion. Um, I move that we approve an extended leave request for a middle school teacher during the 2012-2013 school year. Second. Shouldn't it be a name? There should be a name. We can name the individual. We can. Yes. yes. Um, Tabitha you. Eastman, the eighth grade social studies teacher. And language arts. And language arts. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, are you the second? Is there any discussion? Meredith? Um, Ms. Eastman is currently on leave. Uh, she was due to return to the school in January and um, has asked for a continuation of her leave through um, February vacation. The substitute who is currently filling um, that leave is available to continue in, um, in that role through the February vacation period and um, that is supported by our interim principal, Mr. Burley. And did you tell us the leave was covered under FMLA? The initial portion of the leave was covered under FMLA and an additional three weeks are covered under FMLA. This is actually covered under the, this request is covered under the teacher's collective bargaining agreement with the board. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Okay. That moves us to item eight, committee reports. Uh, Mr. Finance Chair, do you have any? Uh, to give? I do not have a report to give, but I will circulate. Um, it's kind of finance and the workshops. So I'll circulate it so we can uh, reassess um, how we can maximize those workshops. Is finance the same as finance? It is. So I, will, I, will, I sent out the email one time, but I didn't get a lot of feedback, so I'll use a larger font. Or maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but you get, you get one more bite of the apple, and then I'll decide. Right. Don't forget the crayons. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, the policy, did you know? Policy committee, well, having been chair of the policy committee for <laughs> a, little, a little over an hour. Um, I can tell you that the, the portion, the smallest portion, but the quickest part of the work has been sort of moved along quite quickly with the help of Drummond and Woodsum, um, moving through the policies that are required by law that we are holding in the district. Um, the rest of the policies, which are, what, three quarters of the policy manual, um, are, are um, policies that we have as a district a lot of leeway in <clears throat> reviewing those policies, ensuring that they're still up to date, or seeing if we can either eliminate them or incorporate um, and merge policies together to try and tackle the size of that binder. So it's a lot of heavy lifting ahead of us. We do intend on continuing to meet on um, the first Monday. Is it the first Monday? from 7.30 till 9 a.m. in the superintendent's office. And I would urge everyone to keep an eye on the agendas as they come out so that you can see which policies are to be reviewed so that we can elicit any comments or feedbacks from the public on those policies as they move through the process because we're moving into a section of policy that um, we could use uh, your feedback. So thank you. Is it thank uh, is that list? That's, I didn't know it was. Meredith actually size. raised her hand. Sorry. 
<laughs> I raised my hand five times and didn't get recognized when I figured I'm jumping in. There's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that as an illustration of that, at the last um, policy meeting we had a preliminary, but someone extended discussion about just the concussion policy was um, an hour a, long. almost an hour long discussion because each of many of these policies are fairly complex in nature and have lots of gradations of detail that, that need to be sorted through and, and weighed appropriately. Um, we will be revisiting that policy once our school physician is on board and once we have um, some final decisions from the legislature. But uh, to, to Joe's point, um, some the of discretion these is are very complex and um, there, it will take some time to work through some of the remaining policies. David? Excuse me. Uh, I, I didn't realize, and if, if it's true, let me know, that the policies that are being considered on Monday are published on the website ahead of time so the public can see it. Mm -hmm. And we still individually going to get copies by email. Uh, Andrea has been sending those agendas to the full board. Okay. And I ask, and it's that under the direction of the new chair, will that, that procedure still be followed? I would duly hope so. Thank you. He's asking. We said under the direction uh, of the new chair. Which chair? So I mean, the chair of the <laughs> policy, policy committee. committee. <laughs> oh, I looked at you because you're the real power behind the throne anyway, so. It is fully my intent to continue that practice unless directed otherwise by policy chair or board chair or the board as a whole. I think that's been valuable and I appreciate Andrea's, all of Andrea's help in keeping board members Enormous help. informed about all of their business. She does a lot of work for us. She does. Okay. Um, does that does that conclude committee reports? There are other committees, and I don't want to leave them out if they want to speak. Okay. Then um, any item nine, school board agenda requests. Are there any agenda requests for upcoming meetings, Mary? I actually have an agenda request. I'd like to um, look at how we evaluate or get a report on how we evaluate co-curricular and extracurricular and athletic um, uh, coaches or leaders. Um, I, I'd just like to get an update and, and a refreshment on that. Okay. Is, is that, will that, is that part of what the state will be, or are they only concerned with teachers? Teachers and administrators, but it won't cover okay. these positions. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, thank you. Any other agenda requests? Okay. Announcements of upcoming meetings? You know when? Kate? Technology has a meeting on, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but December 13th at 2 o'clock at the town hall in the basement, the IT side of the basement. That's the right time. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Any other upcoming meetings? Okay. Uh, strategic planning will meet December 19th at noon um, for its next meeting. All right, um, that brings us to adjournment. Do I have a motion? I move that we adjourn. Second? Second. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you, John. It is, isn't it?